Welcome to You Are History, Ohio Edition, a captivating series of interviews that spotlight the influential voices and impactful stories of black leaders hailing from the vibrant state of Ohio. In this exclusive series, we delve into the lives, achievements, and experiences of trailblazing individuals who leave an indelible mark on their communities and beyond. Through engaging conversations and profound insights, we uncover these exceptional Ohio-based influencers, unique perspectives, challenges, and triumphs, showcasing the dynamic contributions of black excellence in the Buckeye State. Join us on this enlightening journey as we honor these remarkable individuals' legacy, resilience, and innovation, affirming that in Ohio, as in the broader tapestry of history, they are not just making history, they are history. Don't forget to like, share, and comment where you're watching. I'm here today with Judge Robert Douglas. Um, we call him Bob Douglas. And he is from Youngstown, Ohio. I believe he is a graduate of South High School. Correct. And um, he has a great story. And when you look at black history, we are history. That is my theme. You are history. And you are living history. Um, you have, your mom was amazing. And so I want you to tell your story because I know it in bits and pieces. And I need to know how in the world did a young black man from the south side of Youngstown become the Job and Family Services Director, a judge, a lawyer, a dad, a son, and a great leader in our community. And I think I missed out some stuff, but I don't want to get it wrong. That's why I have you telling your own story. So, Mr. Douglas, tell me, what was it like growing up in Youngstown? Well, Youngstown was a very interesting place. Um, the one thing that was quite remarkable was the steel mills. Um, really bustling, and um, quite a bit of wealth was in Youngstown. And also for the average person, uh, they did very well. Uh, I live, interestingly enough, on, um, on the south side, as you mentioned, on Myrtle Avenue. And uh, my observation was that most of the people in my neighborhood and when I say my neighborhood, I meant like Kenmore and also Garfield uh, streets that were contiguous to Myrtle Avenue. They owned their homes. Um, uh, mostly it was a mixed neighborhood. You had uh, other ethnic groups in the neighborhood, particularly Italian, uh, Slovak, uh, Greek, uh, Jewish population was there also. But um, the thing, as I mentioned, many people own their homes. I found that to be quite, quite remarkable. As well, they would buy a new car every couple of years. And in conversations with my sister about our growing up, we realized that we live in a middle class neighborhood. And in comparison to our situation was, uh, as my mother called it, uh, a three room shack. Um, so to, to make an uh, observation about that, we, we felt like we were affected by the values of that neighborhood. Uh, in particular, um, people had a strong work ethic. Um, they were, again, they were property owners. They participated uh, in uh, activities in the community. And I believe that that affected us uh, as poor people uh, in terms of our values. So that's one thing that I kind of stands out in my growing up uh, in, 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 in Youngstown on the South Side. Now, if you don't mind me asking, what decade, what years were they? Uh, this, was, this, this was back in the 50s, 60s, 70s? Yes. yes. Um, 50s, uh, well, late 40s too. Uh, late 40s and 50s uh, were the real, real boom years, as I would uh, observe. And so you were in a middle class family 
on the south side of Youngstown. Neighborhood. Neighborhood. Yeah. And the community, because everybody lived together. Everybody knew everyone. Yeah. Um, you went to the public schools. Yeah. How did you make it through and not end up in the steel mill? Wow. Wow. That's a very interesting uh, question. One of the things that I would uh, say is that my mother almost, I would call it a, a mantra, uh, was get an education. And if I recall correctly, that came from my grandfather, her father. Uh, he wanted his uh, grandchildren to uh, go to college. And so I heard uh, get that education, get that paper quite often. So that the importance of education was inculcated in me for, for a very long time and from a, a very uh, early age. I would let me quickly add that my father uh, passed away in 1944 uh, uh, from tuberculosis. So my mother took care of her four young children. Um, from that point on, um, I was four years old. Um, and I, I have to make note of that because uh, she was very strong, very courageous uh, uh, woman who had set an example. I mentioned her before you. I mentioned your mom when I when I introduced you because I had a chance to meet her. Yes, she was right. a small woman. She was a little lady. And well, you was, uh, she, he, no, no, no. She she was she was short in stature. <laughs> um, and I, I think you're about six foot two, six foot four. Six five. Okay, and um, you know she. I mean she. You were four when she, your dad passed, and she raised you and your family. Right. So how in the world did she control a four-year-old growing into a six-foot-five when she was only about five-foot-two? Well, first of all, she, she was an interesting woman. Um, and and to, as an example of that, we called her, her name was Catherine. And by the way, um, I had an older sister, a younger sister, and a younger brother, uh, by the way. Uh, we called her uh, Cat, uh, and I thought that was unusual, and still think it was unusual, uh, that we were able to call her Cat, and she approved of it. Uh, so I found that to be uh, quite quite interesting uh, with her. But yes, she was a very very strong lady, and uh, didn't marry until she got into her seventies. Uh, so she was, she was a domestic most of her life, um, all around Youngstown and, and, uh, would ride the bus to work out and, and walk to work back then. So what I'm getting at is that, uh, I did as well as my brothers and sisters had a great example of a strong work ethic. And, um, that never was a problem for us, uh, doing something or getting the job, working. And um, that hard work was just a part of our experience. But, but the respect and the navigation, you got, you got to understand, children are children. Kids are kids. We all grow up. We get to a certain point where we have our own mind. And if you don't have correction and navigation, um, you can become extremely wayward. Sure, sure, sure. And what we're seeing today is single family homes in which you say you came out of, but there was a navigator and a compass inside that home who set the record straight early. Yes, yes, uh, very clearly. And I, I keep going back to that mantra about getting an education and, and uh, we all have something to do. You know, uh, be it washing the windows, uh, scrubbing the floor, or sweeping, you know, the house, uh, uh, making our beds, and um, um, and we did not complain about it. And um, she always would 
ask us to help her that that uh, she couldn't do it all by herself. And I, I she appealed to uh, our goodness, so to speak. And uh, I think we adhere to that quite a bit. How do you think um, with today's young people? Because we don't have responsibilities like we had. I had chores. Um, you said you you know we worked around we we were we were we were built with the work ethic early. Okay. Somehow our young people don't have the same ethic. Yes, yes, and and let me take that a little further too. Um, um, you could say that broadly too, you know, about young people across all social economic lines, and um, I don't know if I could really explain that uh, there's been so many uh, changes in our culture and our social systems and uh, you know how we live and our values and so forth but uh, yes that was a dramatic change um, uh, the only one place i see it uh, operating um, which was um, an element that was very important in my life was in sports and athletics uh, and i i know s some of um my uh, work experience and um, um, playing football and basketball was part of my work ethic, and, and I think that played a part. Now, that's going to deal with X number of people, children, so to speak. Uh, now, for, you know, outside of that, I really couldn't really make a judgment because there's just been so many changes from that time. So... After school, you went to. Did you? You didn't go in the military. You went straight to college. Well, that, that's a that's an interesting question. First of all, <laughs> I, I I went to Monroe Elementary School, and then Hillman Junior High School, uh, and then South High School. Uh, let me tell you what happened there. Um, school was a different experience, and not the best. But I, I, I do appreciate the fact that I was able to negotiate uh, school as, as, as much as I could. Um, I was taking general courses when I was in junior high, when I started junior high, and through uh, high school. And I could have, but nobody really talk to me about it like counselors and uh, my mother was too busy with trying to you know take care of us to really uh, get into the nitty-gritty of um, what courses to take and ended up taking uh, general courses my basketball coach uh, at South High School and I never failed to mention him because he was so important in my life his name was Merle Roselle. Um, he found out that I was taking uh, a mechanic course or something. I can't remember what it was down at, at Chopin. And he got me one day and chewed me out. He took me in a room. I still remember this. And I remember the room at, at the old South Isle building right now. Uh, he chewed me up and down about not taking some challenging courses free college courses, you know, uh, uh, the sciences and math. And um, he, he said to me that you can go to college. Nobody ever told me that uh, I could go to college. And uh, he was very serious about it. I ended up taking uh, algebra and ge geometry, I think, uh, chemistry, I believe. Uh, those were prerequisites for college. But I, I, I share that story as much as I, I can because I'm very grateful to him that he uh, helped me to believe, and I did believe I could go to college and uh, ended up getting a scholarship to go to Youngstown State University. I graduated in 1958. Now, that was Youngstown College. Uh, yes, it was Youngstown <laughs> College uh, when I started. You're right. And um, it then... Uh, I can't, several years later, it turned to Youngstown University, and then much later, it turned into Youngstown State University. 
but yes, thank you for that, uh, that correction. Um, uh, so I started college in 58 out of high school. I got through the first semester and, it, and I got into the second semester. Uh, I don't think there were quarters then. And I realized I was in deep water without a paddle. Uh, in other words, I was not prepared for college. And uh, although I had the scholarship, the basketball scholarship, I made the decision to quit, quit college and join the military in 1959. Um, so that was a real turning point in my life. Um, and I'll just say about the military that first of all, I have great respect for armed services and, and the experience of being in the military uh, serving people. But um, I tell people that I, I grew up and which is what really happened. I think I was, uh, uh, I really wasn't equipped as a, as I should have been as a young man, but I grew up in the military and I went from being a, a boy really to, to a young man. So I give a lot of credit to the, to the military for that. And so well, while you were in college, now what branch of the military, let me go back. What branch of the military? I went into the Army. I, I, was, I, I volunteered for three years. I spent two years in Germany. Wow. And this was back in 19... From 59 to 62, I was in the military. And I um, uh, went straight to Germany after basic training because of the Berlin crisis was going on then. And then after the three years when I was getting out, it was the Cuban crisis. Uh, and... As I was getting out, very significantly, the Vietnam War was heating up. And um, in some respects, that was a good decision, uh, going into the military and coming out and not uh, having that, uh, God bless all the soldiers who were there, uh, the experience of, um, of Vietnam. Um, and I say that because I've I, I've had a lot of friends who, um, you know, were affected by the experience in Vietnam. So you went back to college after you got out of the military, because I know that you pledged and you were part of the campus. Yes, you know. Uh, so now did you do that pre or did you do that post or did you do that graduate? After, after, after I came back and got back in school. Um, there was another point I was going to make, but, uh, but, uh, that was after I came back and I think I had been in uh, probably my second or third year. I, um, met, uh, my best friend who still my best friend today, Alex Murphy. And, uh, he told me about Kappa, uh, and, uh, I was very, very impressed with Kappa men in Youngstown in particular, um, judges, uh, doctors. Can you give me some of those names that you can remember? You might not get them all, oh, but so yeah. they'd be mentioned. Uh, yeah, uh, yes, both of the Haynes brothers. Um, you know, uh, they, had, they had a law practice. Um, Judge Haynes, Attorney Haynes? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes, um, him and his brother. Um, I'm trying to think of their first name. Um, sorry about that. That's okay. Uh, but uh, the Haynes brothers, um, Nate Jones was a Kappa, uh, Bob Pagese, who was a school superintendent. Um, and then uh, there's, a, there's a several more. Dr. Armstrong. And, and then Dr. Armstrong, yes, on a larger level. Uh, yes, you're right, uh, for sure. Um, my membership card is signed by a gentleman, Mayor Bradley, of the first mayor of a very large city. Of, of Los Angeles. Tom, Tom yes. Tom, Tom Bradley. Bradley. His wow. Name is on my membership card. And uh, so I was impressed uh, with a lot of uh, gentlemen who had achieved and were leaders in, in the community. Uh, I remember a gentleman, Bill Rouse, uh, he was a scientist. I remember him coming to town. Carl Stokes uh, was a Kappa and his brother. Um, so uh, 
very, uh, very good example that I wanted to follow. And so you went to the military, came back and went to college. I knew, yeah. that, I, knew, I knew that you got involved. How did mentoring, because you know everybody's talking about mentorship and mentoring. How did you, I mean, how did, how did black men mentor before we had all these other mentors? Because now the mentors don't even look like us. Yeah, well, uh, that's a very good question. I'm glad you asked that. Um, first of all, um, uh, regarding uh, getting back into college while I was in the military, I had a lot of time to think. And I uh, saw a few things, uh, and I was able to look around and see and understand the importance of education uh, in terms of leadership, in terms of getting promotions and so forth. So. Uh, and, and, and I knew education was a part of that. So I made up my mind to, to go, uh, uh back to college uh, during that time. But, um, you know, I found my, my mentors and, and that's the best way I can describe it because I've always had a mentor or mentors in my life. And when I did come across, um, men black men who who i thought were you know good leaders and and movers and shakers i hung around them as much as i could and i learned a lot from a lot of men and i this is something that it almost seemed like i planned to do that you know to have me a mentor and i still have a few here or there uh, and not having a father, that was even more important to me. Uh, so, and I could even, even on on, on uh, different levels, uh, for instance, one of my jobs I had as a teenager was I was a horse groom. And um, um, there was a gentleman in my neighborhood, he was a horse trainer, and I ended up working, you know, in, in the, on, out on the fairgrounds. And... Um, uh, you know, working with the horses, cleaning out stalls, whatever else. But the trainer, his name was Gray Barron. Um, he's, there, I had two other partners that we were working for him, but he taught us how to groom and how to take care of ourselves, you know, mm -hmm. and um, to look nice, to dress nice, to smell good. Uh, and uh, uh, so uh, that was again by accident. And then I remember another one who, who uh, was very important from an educational standpoint, a gentleman by the name of Ezel Armour. Ezel Armour uh, was uh, assistant director of the welfare department. That's what it was called at the time. And then he became director. And he caught me one day. Uh, we were working out on the air base uh, out in um, Liberty out there. He says, um, we're going to start a couple programs or a program uh, at the department, and I need somebody with a bachelor's degree. I had just finished my bachelor's degree, and um, that was my beginning into uh, human services. Uh, and then, right after that, and I'd worked for about two years, I believe, as a caseworker or in this particular program, um, he got on my back and says, listen, you should go over to Pitt and get your master's degree in social work. And he told me about a program that the state of Ohio had that would pay uh, for tuition, pay for books, and even a little stipend. Uh, I was married at the time with my first child. And um, so he pushed me on that. So I ended up going to uh, University of Pittsburgh and getting my master's degree in social work. So, and then after that, after I wanted to move on and be more challenged, I decided that I wanted to uh, go to law school. And there he was, Ezel Armour was pushing me to do that. Not pushing, but supporting me in there when I needed a little counseling and wanted to talk about it and so forth. So those are several examples that, that um, um, and, and again, I love your question because uh, those mentors were very important. I remember Dr. Stewart, he was a dentist and he was a wealth of information and his whole family and a lot of history uh, in his family. And I used to just uh, sit at his throne, as I called it, and uh, listen to uh, bits of wisdom. He called them pearls. 
And um, I remember so well uh, something he told me. He says, now, I'm giving you this. If, if, uh, if you use it and you think it works, I want you to promise me to pass it on. And I, I, I thought that was just great advice. So you went to the military, got your bachelor's at Youngstown State, then came and went to get your master's, and then went to law school. And in Correct. the meantime, worked as a social worker at the welfare department. Were you downtown Youngstown when they were there, or were you? Where were you? Where were you working when you were when you were first a caseworker? What air? What, what was the location? When I started uh, the building, there were two buildings. Uh, well, the main one was on the corner of Park Avenue and Belmont, right across the street from St. E's. Wow. I knew that I knew it was there first before it came downtown. Yes. Before it came downtown to the parkade when it was down in the basement by McKelly's. Yes. And even before the Belmont location, it was um, hmm, somewhere in Glenwood and downtown. That was early on back in the forties. Um, yeah, back in the forties thereabouts. Um, but I was there when they were on the Belmont location, and I was still there when they moved uh, downtown to the McKelvey building, but um, we ended up having two buildings. Yes, that's what it was. I stayed in the Belmont building. And then you became, then, then how did you become director? Because you became director, didn't you? Yes, I did. And let me back up. Because um, there was some time there, but there was some, there was, I missed some space. Well, let me, let me, I have to back up to when I finished law school, I worked for legal service for a short period, a couple of years. And then I also worked for the city in the community development agency. Wow. My title was a citizen participation attorney. And that pretty much involved, that's when Youngstown really had a big issue with HUD uh, when they weren't really going along with the program, so to speak, in terms of using the money uh, for different projects in Youngstown. And I think they held up the money for a while until they got certain positions and, and changed some policy and so forth. So I worked for, um, for the city for uh, I, uh, maybe two years. I got uh, a job in Warren after that position. I was director of the Department of Welfare, Seal Welfare Department, uh, in the city of Warren for Trumbull County. Wow. Yes, right. So that was a that was short lived, uh, and I'm I'm suffering <laughs> a little bit because it was my really uh, first introduction and excursion into politics. Okay. And uh, I, I was naive in my political skills, and uh, so uh, within that statement, I didn't last too long. It's a whole interesting story. So there's a, so so there is a difference between acquiring jobs and playing politics to stay in position. Well, well, if I understand your question, um, because some people don't know the difference. I mean, we go to work and we and we think we don't play, but you still play in politics at certain levels. It's just at a different level. Correct, correct, correct. Uh, that's that's a good way to put it. Um, I learned, you know, at that level, at least, anyhow. Uh, director, you know, I was appointed by the commissioners, you know, and, and I serve at their pleasure. Uh, so there's a politic there. And this go back to Mr. Armour, when he became um, uh, assistant director of the uh, Mahoney County Welfare Department, there was a strong black men group uh, in Youngstown at the time, Monk Tillman, Ooh. I can't think of all the names, but uh, uh, Isidore Blakely and so forth were very, uh, Arlette, you know, that those type of guys, they, they pushed for him to become, to get that position. Uh, and I remember that very well. So that, you're right, that was a politic uh, that was very important back then. And, and it really and it, and it helped me, but uh, again, after leaving uh, the Trumbull County Department of Human Services, I learned that if I wanted to 
work in public service and in particular uh, government positions on any level, uh, I must be political. And from that point on, I was, um, um, and I was part of a group of people in Mourn started uh, a group called the 17th Congressional District Caucus. You were a part of that? I was the, I was the first president and president for several years, about four or five years. Uh, it was modeled off of the 21st Congressional District Caucus uh, uh, in Cleveland. The Out of Cleveland. Right. And uh, man, I learned a lot of politics from, from that group. I would go up there and uh, there was a couple guys who were originally from Youngstown. Uh, but I'd go up there and go to their meetings and learned a lot. And that 17th Congressional District Caucus was a very instrumental group uh, for for many. Matter of fact, Doug Franklin, uh, who, who's mayor more now, he came out of that group way back when. Um, what's her name now? She's a councilman there. She was in the group. Um, so, um, uh, I I needed to be in politics. So from that point on, I was deep into politics. So much so, so uh, Tracy, that um, uh, that's where, um, well, I got appointed uh, um, to be assistant prosecutor with Dennis Watkins, who's still there up in war. That is true. Uh, yes, and he wanted me to, when he first became a prosecutor, uh, this was like 82, thereabouts, 81, and blah, 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 blah. Um, but uh, good guy, good guy, and um, in spite of my little experience at uh, at that welfare department, he uh, he liked me and and uh, he hired me. And then after there for about a year and a half, Jim Trafficker went to the congressional seat, and Jim Trafficker tracked me down in Columbus. Him and his top aide and his Bob. I want you to work for me, and, um, and I, I had to make a real tough decision because working for Dennis Watkins was a great experience, and um, and certainly some further opportunities would have resulted from that experience. Uh, but I chose to go with uh, Jim because, first of all, we have been friends. It was a good move. We have been friends for a year out of college play ball together, go see the Browns. So we had a, a strong friendship and um, he wanted somebody like me around, particularly, and, and the fact that I had a law degree, I think that made a big difference too. So uh, so that was a tough decision, but um, like I said, I, I didn't think I would ever have the opportunity to serve on the federal level, um, uh, but, but who knows. So you went to gym trafficking? And then came back to become. Where did you go from 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 working at the federal level? How did you get back to job and family services director of Mahoning County? Because from there you went to become judge. When I met you, you were muni judge. Uh, yeah. Well, well, what I was just saying, I'll just pick up from there. Um, uh, with Jim, I think uh, four years maybe. I'm thinking, and um, I've always. Uh, wanted to be challenged and to grow. And most of my jobs during that period were at most six years, four, five, six years. I didn't want to get stuck in one place. I wanted to grow and be challenged. So after about three or four years, I think, with Jim, I wanted to, you know, spread my wings and fly a little bit. And the position, uh, came vacant when Vince Gooden left uh, at the Mahoney County Department of Human Services. So I expressed an interest in that, uh, and it was very competitive, and uh, I had to deal with and be challenged with some strong currents from many places uh, in the political community and the professional community. And, and to get that job. So Jim was very supportive. Um, and he, 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 he did some things that he helped me to get it with some people. And, um, he, he asked me if you want it. I said, yes. He said, let's go get it. So, 
Um, that's how I got that job at the, as director. That was in 1988. I became director there. They had just moved into the old McGuffey Plaza uh, from that downtown McKelvey uh, location that we just talked about. Um, uh, so that's that's how I happened to uh, get to the Department of Service. I was there for eight years, by the way. Right. Um, uh, a lot yeah, of changes. Yeah, and it was a great experience. I wish I had the time, but I would tell you one one experience in terms of um, um, uh, installing a management system uh, in um, the uh, Department of Human Services, and in fact, got some national recognition for that. It was very effective, um, uh, and uh, the staff loved it, um, and it, it was a great experience. So um, then uh, I retired. Well, I. I Oh, yeah, I retired from the welfare department. Yes, mm -hmm. I did. 20, uh, 1996. Yeah, 96. And I was going to do some consulting and something else. I can't remember for sure, but um, I was out for about a year. I was doing some consulting. I'm sorry. Yes, I was doing some with the Department of Human Services, the State Department, that is. And then... Um, um, this vacancy came up in the judgeship. Judge Luke Levy decided to step down. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is where things got very interesting. Um, and, and by the way, just before retiring, um, in conjunction with uh, my great friend, uh, Percy Squire, mm -hmm. uh, we co-counseled that um, voting rights case. Wow. Uh, the, the, yes. The, the, yes, I remember that. Which uh, was a four-year experience starting in the uh, district court. In reference to gentrification. Let's, we, let's, we gotta slow this down because this was a very, very, and this was the first time someone had really had challenged the lines being drawn. Yes, yes. Am I not mistaken? And you guys won that case. That's how Sylvester Patton became yes. state right. rep. Yes, yes. Yeah, well, it's quite an experience. Um, and and I'm just going to make note of this. Um, Please. Tracy, you come back uh, about the radio station, but I got to stay on the... Um, we'll get back to there. The voting rights case. Um, I think it was over a period of four years. Again, we started in... Um, uh, the, uh, the federal district court in Cleveland. Uh, we lost uh, magistrate and, and uh, federal district judge. Then we appealed it um, uh, to the court of appeals in Cincinnati. Uh, we had uh, we were heard by a three judge panel. Uh, out of that three judge panel, they decided that uh, it should go before the full court uh, on bunk, which meant that. Uh, the entire 12 or 13 judges uh, heard the case. Normally, it's just three, a three-judge panel. And then after the en banc experience, they said it should go before a special three-judge panel. And the more uh, very interesting part about that, Judge Nathaniel Jones was on that three-judge panel. Wow. So, uh, uh, so that's when we... Uh, we were successful. And I said the word, I said, Jerry, I said, this is gerrymandering. Uh, yes. Right. Gerrymandering. Then we uh, got very active and worked with the Republican Party, and they helped us form a district that ended up being the one that Sylvester Patton got. We literally carved out that district. Yes, you did. Um, uh, so that was quite an experience. I'm, I'm speeding a little bit and I want to pick back up on the radio station just to say this, uh, that was between the voting rights case and the, and the uh, radio station experience, uh, two of my most memorable experiences that I've had, but uh, in the course of preparing for that case and, and managing that case, um, we learned a lot about the community. Uh, historically and otherwise, but one thing that we realized that we needed um, an organ in addition to the Buckeye Review. 
and um, and that was the radio station. Um, we fought to get um, a permit from the FCC. Uh, FCC. We built the station from scratch, the tower and everything, um, and that how that generally. Happened. I don't think people know what went on to make WRBP 102 jams come into fruition. Yeah, yeah. There was a lot of politics that went along the way, and there was a lot of one-sidedness. But the importance of owning your own stick, and at that time, the everything was shifting. And we see what happens when you don't own your own communication source. Sure. Because sure. when you don't own your own commun communication source, you have what you see today. Right, right. Because no one's speaking to who we are from a culture that they understand. Right, right. And what you're saying is the conversation that we, we were having after after we really understood the importance of having that voice and those messages uh, out there and uh, getting people's attention with the music, you know, and... Uh, so that, that was, again, uh, I was very proud to have been a part of that. And so during that time, you, we, we did the, um, the time to, when you, when you, when we carved out the 51st district, I think it was, Sylvester Patton's representative district. And you were at that time in private practice or doing consulting. Because somehow they picked you and you ended up on the bench. And, you, and then, because that's, that's where you retired from. Um, my I always tell people I retired twice, which I did. Um, when I retired from the uh, Department of Human Services. Um, and then I went back to the judgeship. Uh, by the way, that was 14, almost 15 years. Um, but... Um, uh, my dates get a little uh, blurred in there, uh, but then I retired again in 2012 from the judgeship. Wow. So what was it like after going through all of this and then sitting at the place where you see the city a little bit differently? Because when you, when you work inside the courtroom, you, you work for the city, um, you've been a part of the community, you've given back to the community, you have lifted the community up, and now you're sitting in a place where you see me not always at my best. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. You get a no. You get a whole new perspective when you sit in the inside of the municipal court as a judge, and because you see me on my bad day. Let me share this story with you. To your point. <clears throat> Um, I remember the, the appointment and I remember I started, uh, the first, it was the first or second of December in, uh, 97. There was a gentleman there, a judge, a retired judge, Caucasian, and he uh, had been there before the decision was made to appoint. Uh, me as uh, to fill the position and he would go on the bench and I would sit and, and watch him uh, and we would go into the chambers and we would have a conversation about what I saw uh, allowed me to ask him questions about different things and he at one point said I, I want to say something to you he said uh, you're needed here he says, even if you don't want to be here, you must be here. And I says, uh, what do you mean? He says, I've been a visiting judge uh, all over the state of Ohio, small communities, urban areas, uh, middle-sized courts. He says, I, I saw something in this court, or I've seen something in this court that I've seen nowhere else. And he said, um, um, I see fear on people's face when they walk in that courtroom. And I didn't quite understand what he was saying until such time I'd been on the bench for quite a while. Uh, Tracy, uh, you could 
see it when people walk in that door or come before me, generally walk in that door and see me up on the bench, people of color, and almost like an exhale um, uh, to see somebody who looked like them um, and uh, kind of put them at ease. And if I had to read um, uh, those expressions, those motions and so forth, uh, and it was at least somebody up there or this person will understand who I am and what I'm all about and um, the chance of fairness was likely. So um, your point was uh, is, is well taken. Because there is a, and this is something that I think that we need to take um, to heart as leaders. The responsibility when I walk into a room and I see someone who looks like me, I'm supposed to feel a confidence of you understand who I am and you won't let anything happen to me bad. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. And that's been a good thing and a bad thing that all of us have had. And the reason why I say that is because a lot of us have had that confidence and we've gotten bad information or we've been led the wrong way or we've been treated unfairly because we took on the, I walk in, I think the judge is gonna remember and he's gonna treat me fair. Yeah. Not because I want you to treat me better. I just want you to treat me fair. Correct. Give me, give me, give me fair, fair judgment, fair access. And we haven't always been as fair as I think we should have been. Well taken. Well taken. I, 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 I don't know if I can add to that. that uh, was, that's well taken. Very well stated. And I think we need to start judging people now, not based on their color, but on their content. Sure. sure. And it's a sum total of Martin Luther King's speech. Because not all character comes with the same hue. Yeah, yeah. Very very well stated. And I thank you for being there because as a judge, I know from my friendship with you, you may not always get it right, but you always try to make it fair. Sure, sure. And, and I, 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 I believe, just based on my experience and uh, talking to other people um, over my retired years and so forth, that. Uh, that was my legacy of, of, of being fair. Um, one other uh, story, great story, I know you'll appreciate. <laughs> uh, you know, after working on that uh, congressional seat uh, experience, um, the vacancy for the judgeship came after that, as I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. But I was a distant, probably 10 <laughs> for getting that position. I was not recognized or recommended by any of the political groups in Youngstown Mahoney County. Uh, all of the women's political groups, um, the uh, black uh, congressional uh, group in Warren, um, Republican Party uh, or the Democrat Party. Uh, so I said, fine. So I told my wife, I said, I'm just going to go off into the sunset and we'll, I'll do some consulting and so forth. My wife and I came down here to Florida and I was checking my, my um, uh, messages, phone messages back home. I got a call from my buddy, Percy Squire, give me a call. And I also got a, a, call, uh, a phone call from um, Bill Benning. Wow. And Bill and I had been friends for, for years, and he used to invite me to his class, and I would speak to the class so forth. So Percy, the person I talked, and he says, uh, the governor, Governor Vonovich at the time, was not picking any of the recommendations. There were about four or five recommendations, all qualified, and he wasn't picking anybody. So I learned later through Bill Benning, uh, 
uh, because I wondered about this for a long time, but he told me out of his mouth, he says, um, he thought about me. He said, Bob Douglas has done a lot in the community. He's qualified and so forth. So he walked down the street when Percy had an office in Youngstown and they talked about it. And uh, certainly Percy was supportive. So uh, Bill says, uh, uh, let me take care of it. So Bill called me, or I called him from down here. He said, do you want it? Uh, the appointment. I said, yes. He says, enjoy your time down there in Florida with your wife. And when you come back, we'll take care of it. So I came back. Uh, I did not even have to go see the governor himself personally. And by the way, um, that's a whole nother story about relationships. A lot of people didn't know that I had some statewide experiences and led a couple uh, our statewide um, uh, association for three years. You want to tell which, tell us which ones those are? Because we need to know. Uh, they don't tell them. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, so, um, one of it signed off on it. And, um, so, I, like I said, I didn't even have to go see him. So, Bill said, we'll take care of it. And that's what happened. That's how I got the position. I was not supposed to get that um, position at least based on the recommendations from the political groups. Here we are full circle again, aren't we? Yes, sir, we are. <laughs> yes, sir, and, we are. And, 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 and that was, you know, the earlier example or story was on the kind of a local politics and this moves up a level of the state, state politics, so to speak. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to get that out because it, it was an interesting experience. And, I, the, I, and, I, and, I, and again, just as with my, my best book, Code for um, Merle Zell, when I tell these stories, I'd like to acknowledge and, and, and give them credit. Um, so again, kudos to um, Bill Benning. I'm gonna, I gotta reach out to him. I, Cause this is um, black history. And we need to know that there have been phone calls and things that get done and you don't wanna get into politics, but you need to be there. Because when you're not there, you can't impact influence. Right. right. And without, and I've seen things change with phone calls. And you want to be the person who makes the phone call. Um, you want to learn from this. And the reason why I'm doing this segment is so that you hear these names and you hear these stories. Because not everything is black and white and reported in the newspapers. Correct. 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 And, and you're, you're exactly right. I'm glad you're doing this too, because, uh, uh, and there's a lot of stories out there. And, and as you, as you mentioned, you can learn a lot from those stories. I'm trying to pull up, I'm trying to, and, we're, and we've lost a lot of stories. When I look at, I've got to get with Alex, but I've got, when you look at Mr. Armour and when you look at Dr. Jones, and I, I've had a chance to meet them, know them, had an interaction with them, but didn't know, we didn't have the wherewithal to capture the interviews like we do today. Mm -hmm. And we have been intimidated by the masses not to tell our testimony. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And because the kids don't see the testimony, they see what they see on TV, and that's not real. Right, 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 right. Good point. And, and I, I appreciate that, that observation because you're right. Um, this, that nitty-gritty stuff, important stuff, you know, uh, does not get reported or published. This is America. This is capitalism. And this is how things happen. And you want to be a part, and we want to teach our children that you don't always act in the newspaper. Sure. You don't always act in public. Yeah. And you still get things done. Absolutely. You got that right. You hit the nail on the head there. So, Judge Douglas, you have been my friend. Um, you have been my, my Urkel All right. for a long time. I appreciate you, um, the history you've made and still making. Thank you. Thank um, the, 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 the trails that you've blazed, I've got to give it Percy, you know, trying to get him to talk is going to be real tough. Yeah, yeah. But yeah. the stories, and we have to do this again because people need to know that there's more to what you see in a person. Sure. There's a lot of story there, and we just touch the surface of them. Yeah. So yeah. I appreciate you, and God bless you and your retirement and what you're doing. Thank you for the sacrifice, mm -hmm. because when you become public, you put your family public and you sacrifice a lot. Yes, whole another story there too. Yes, right, right. Thank and you, Tracy. Uh, very well done, and uh, 
this is a, a, a good service that you're providing. I thank you, and God bless you. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. We extend our heartfelt gratitude to each viewer who has joined us on this journey through your history. Suppose you have found inspiration, insight, and connection in the stories shared by our remarkable guests. In that case, we invite you to consider supporting the continuation of community programming like this through a donation. Your contribution will help us amplify diverse voices, celebrate rich histories, and foster meaningful dialogue that uplifts and unites us all. We also extend a special thank you to our sponsors whose generous support has made this series possible. May you, our history, continue to resonate in your hearts and minds, inspiring you to embrace the beauty of diversity and the power of unity. Thank you for being a part of this transformative journey, and we look forward to welcoming you back for more engaging and enlightening content in the future. Don't forget to like and share this video, subscribe to this channel, and give God the glory.